gentlemen, in the interest of time, while my panelists are still getting away from sound, I thought I would stop by an introduction so long. My name is Amina Fisser. I am here today also representing CFA Institute in to my role as the president of CFA Society South Africa. And South Africa actually refers to the region, to the South region, not to the country. So I'm very much here on home ground in Botswana and wonderful to be here in that capacity with all of you as well. The CFA Institute, the mission of the CFA Institute is to promote the high standards of in, uh, within the global investment profession, high standards in terms of ethics, education and professional excellence, most importantly for the benefit of the ultimate benefit of society. And I hope that you will engage with the capital markets brief that we released earlier today and really use it as an opportunity to showcase Africa and its capital markets and the investment opportunities that it represents. But I also do have a day job. My day job is that of an ETF strategist, and I do need to just share with our lovely MC. I mean, she's been amazing, don't you agree? I think she's done an excellent job. But I need to just educate you one bit further in terms of an EFT versus an ETF. So an EFT, quite correctly, is an electronic funds transfer. But an ETF is an exchange traded fund. <laughs> and certainly one of the aspects of alternative assets which um, we are going to be discussing in our now shortened panel discussions that must be very fast. Please know this is because we are under time constraints and we have got a lot to get through. Because alternative assets actually is an incredibly comprehensive group of investment opportunities. It ranges all the way from ETFs to things like private equity, emission capital, derivatives markets, physical commodities, um, real estate, infrastructure, the range goes on. And as such, I'm sure you can appreciate it is not a homogenous asset class. It is not something that we can generalize about and apply the same set of rules um, as we go along through that. So I really want to um, use this opportunity to thank my panelists in advance for helping us to just highlight some of the, the potential benefits that alternative asset classes can bring to African capital markets. Because certainly what we've seen is in, in recent times, and especially so in the emerging frontier markets, the low returns that we've experienced have really sort of driven this demand for alternative assets, not just in a search for yield or in a search of return, but also as ways to manage this to really sort of get part of portfolio diversification going. And, and therefore I think it's, it's important for us to be able to look at how these alternative asset classes can be brought into mainstream portfolio management in particular, of course, via our stock exchanges as well. And I think very, very importantly for me, we've heard a lot today the term FBI, Fund Direct Investment being bandied about. But I've heard very, very little about what we can do to mobilize all the capital that's already sitting on the African continent. I refer to it as dead capital. Um, you can also refer to it as debt capital because actually it's one of the same. The debt owed by um, pension funds in Africa really represents debt capital unless we look at initiatives to mobilize that capital and really deploy it constructively in terms of the um, investment opportunity set that we so desperately need here in Africa. So I'm going to take a seat. Um, unfortunately, my, my panel has already been introduced. Um, certainly, the very impressive biographies are in the conference pamphlet. So I encourage you to have a look at that. But I'm going to head over to my seat and let's get started on this ASAP. Thank you. The past decade has seen some incredible uh, returns, investment returns in developed markets, but a lot less so in um, developing and emerging and frontier markets in particular. There is also the expectation that the next decade might not be quite as rosy for developed markets. How do you see it from your perspective? Do you see it being different for frontier markets such as African markets, or are we going to find ourselves in much the same boat? African markets tend to be a good deal more cyclical than. Market. So, uh, the the in here are deeper and the other times are a lot, uh, a lot higher. Um, and just where we find ourselves today, look at what's, you know, what's really driven with the development returns. Um, 
that you close into uh, small and large cap or large large cap allocations. Um, so businesses are safe, uh, steady growth, normal debt. So I'm gonna call this I'm gonna give you a minute. Um that's really what's driven market the other market trends, especially over the last five six Um I think part of that has been um that the amount of geopolitical and political uncertainty in the world has gone up. And so global institutional investors uh, are looking for what they perceive to be safe places to their money. Uh, probably the most extreme example of this is the fact that about fifteen trillion dollars worth of bonds are currently uh, yielding negative uh, yields. Uh, if you buy it today and if you hold it to maturity, uh, you're going to lose money. It's, it's guaranteed. The only way you're going to make money is if someone else buys that bond from you. And those are bonds typically issued by countries that people keep very safe, like Switzerland, Germany, etc. So that's all the indicative of, of quite uh, scared markets. But on the other hand, um, when you now look at what's going on in particular African markets, other country markets, um, to our mind, these, these markets are offering tremendous value. Um, and so from from an alternative perspective, we think it's actually very good option. Right? So whether that's you know, infrastructure, private equity, direct property, uh, and I'm speaking generally here across the North and the markets. Uh, but generally speaking, if one can go and originate product in these markets and, and offer it to institutional investors, um, we think the return market is really good. Right. Um, one thing I think I'm um, sorry, I think a lot of people to the hunt yield, also, especially from the developed markets, where those negative yielding bonds are not delivering what investors require. And, and that in itself should represent an opportunity in Africa. What opportunity do you see for alternative asset classes in Africa? And in particular, how can we bring those opportunities to the African capital markets and the stock exchanges in particular? Thank you, Brenda. Um, so, the big thing for asset classes and the equity asset classes have traditionally been uh, the two most common ways of investing uh, for a lot of different investors, especially in investors. But I think um, with the growing demand for accessing different forms of capital, uh, there is a need for us to sort of diversify the products offering. And um, this is largely driven because it's a very uh, high correlation between uh, the demand side where people are saying we want to fund the sort of opportunity if there are ways that uh, sort of capital product in the market that can meet that need. Uh, the second thing is that uh, investors also chasing yields, uh, they're really highly yield driven and these traditional asset classes are now becoming less and less uh, strong in terms of value, in terms of valuation in terms of the, the yield offering. And that leads to all the risk diversification. So, uh, given those three key objectives, uh, we're seeing uh, the emergence of alternative assets as a key uh, opportunity for investment. Uh, again, comparatively, we have a certain amount of private equity investments. Uh, the multiples uh, being offered by private equity opportunities are becoming more and more attractive for, for future investments. So there's a very uh, slow shift towards uh, alternative. Uh, you can see specifically for us in Kenya, we have realized that that's the direction uh, future market will take it. And so we have gone ahead and started offering a lot of these products to uh, address those needs. Uh, the first thing we had to do was to reform the regulation so that it allow local research investors, especially pressure funds and insurance companies, to actually have uh, asset class accommodation in the corporate guidelines. So, for instance, we do have a 30% cap for the uh, lease uh, market, we do have 5% cap for derivatives. PE is a 10% cap, so that we are able to accommodate all that. The other thing that we have to do is that we have an efficient stock market that can actually trade those stocks. Because probably about the fact that you're investing in alternative, you need to offer a position with it. And that is an attractive opportunity for professional public discussion. So through that approach, then I've been able to do much, especially in the launch of the market. And uh, another one of the products, the ETF suites, are now gaining currency. So I think there's a case uh, for alternative assets. Uh, I can see more and more 
uh, markets, uh, technological opportunities, and I think we you know from uh, Microsoft Asia that a lot of the clients, mainly the high network individuals, have 50, 75 percent of their portfolio in alternatives, and that gives you the, uh, the message of how how massive alternatives are becoming. Again, looking back to uh, the previous presentation, the discussions, uh, uh, I actually took the notes saying that the bank rate was 0.75 percent is low here in Botswana. Well, for me, I I think the highest rate I've seen in Europe since I started working 15 years ago was probably 2 to 0.5 percent. I've been with negative interest rates for the past uh, seven years. So then I think to uh, try to explain how alternatives have been uh, growing so much, we need to look how investors look to these products. You know, and we need to look to their behavior. Uh, people are not happy when uh, the interest of return starts to decrease. It's usually what happens when interest rates go down, even when economic growth starts to slow down. So they are looking for uh, a different exposure or alpha, which alternative price provides. Um, and second, trying to change their payoff profile instead of Delta One, trying to get deals on the flat market, getting a positive return on an equity market. And I think that's where alternatives can in because you know private equity, future products, derivatives, they can offer um, that type of uh, returns. Um, so I mean, it, it's been growing massively. In Africa, still a very niche. Uh, market, but um, the delay I was happy to follow with uh, Robert Schiller, and you know, I was I asked him what was his biggest uh, uh, the thing that he was most proud of, and the one that he was most sad. And the, the one that one thing that he mentioned is that after 60 years of uh, financial uh, studies that show that we need to diversify. People still go to diversify. And that's where you know I'll tell you it's a mean. Uh, and that's how we can in Africa. They need to be offered to uh, investors so they can diversify their that Thank you. Um uh, this part of the of the diversification is not just in the nature of these alternative investments, but also the form and the format through which one can access. So whether you're talking about things like digitization or tokens or structured products or notes, these sort of um, advanced technologies and so on present quite a challenge for regulators in particular. Do you think that regulators can, and regulations can actually be accommodated and be proactive in terms of enabling the growth and adoption of these across the African continent? Uh, well, for deciding on whether they can be or not, uh, probably we need to assess what the brand stands in the main markets other than the alternative market. So today in the morning there has been thrown some figures that are quite, uh, I would say, alarming when it comes to market cap as a percent of GDP in Africa. So that's the main street investment for the main market investments still is by far under potential in this, in this area. So this is in alarming in itself. Uh, the second point that has just been mentioned is the increase of assets under management in alternatives up to the 13 trillion mark that has been mentioned now. And this in itself, again, is showing us that probably foreign markets or regulated markets and regulators either are not doing something uh, right or are doing something wrong in this area not to capture all of these investments uh, in that field. And the third point was related to how investors react to returns. Uh, because this probably could be one of the core problems as well that we're witnessing nowadays. Uh, I believe we need to differentiate between plain vanilla alternatives and structured products, the uh, uh, tokenization of assets and so on and so forth. Uh, in both cases, alternative assets at the end, uh, for them to be widespread, they need to enter into mainstream capital markets with the hope that they are widespread and traded in other areas. However, the main problem, and here uh, I believe that we are at a key juncture, it is either the regulators and markets like ourselves realize that uh, there is something wrong that needs to be adjusted because without having mainstream market you won't have alternative investments. Alternative investments will be the mainstream in terms of investment opportunities. 
So the regulators and the market operators like ourselves need to realize that we are in a deep juncture. Either we realize that there is something wrong that needs, uh, I would say, radical improvement, a radical change in terms of uh, financial literacy and advocacy, in terms of supporting companies to get listed at a certain point to maintain the alternative market or the main market, sorry, uh, as vibrant as it is required, and to allow as well market operators and organizers like exchanges to actually go into the areas of alternative investments and go into the area of developing platforms that would enable alternative investments to uh, flourish in an organized fashion. Otherwise, they're going to lose the entire organized market to unorganized markets and alternative investments that we don't have any control whatsoever on it, any not control about how it is widespread or the level of complexity in it in this, in this world. So this juncture is quite important. And I believe all the associations like ourselves and all market operators need to advocate for uh, regulators to be to deregulate the markets now rather than overregulate the markets as it is happening to enable, I would say, exchanges to start thinking with the ideas of the peer-to-peer -peer lending of the California platforms, the peer-to-peer -peer insurance, and so on and so forth. Because without having these types of platforms. Alternative investments will always find their way because at the end, one of the biggest uh, mistakes conducted by um, big banks, changes, big brokerage companies, investment banks, is always trying to cater for institutional investors without or being oblivious towards retail or individual investors because it's much cost costlier in terms of trying to retain those. However, without having those participating in the group, they will always go to alternative means of the investment that being as enhanced. Regulation is actually a crucial part in terms of one uh, supporting exchanges and market operators in doing what needs to be done to uh, uh, be ahead of the curve. As well. At least, I wouldn't say that we can be ahead of the curve, but at least be in the curve rather than having to wait and see what happens in the markets. That's on the one hand. And to hear the rich markets and to enable companies to come back to the traditional sense or at least the digitization, tokenization of the alternative assets to have regulated markets that they can get listed and trade easily and hence being widespread across the across the world. Well, I think we understand a bit more from investors outside of the continent is coming from in terms of all from alternative assets. But we certainly see that there is a wish from the product providers and exchanges in Africa to, to provide the necessary growth in terms of but the other important part of the demand equation is the local investor, the African continent, so the Asian fund investment side. Are you seeing a demand for alternative assets coming from that particular spectrum? And if so, um, do they want it but they're not allowed to have it just yet? Or is there even a lack of demand from continent investors for alternative assets? Um, so we are seeing that demand. Uh, and I think where that originates is that pension fund. Asian funds are basically prepared for mm -hmm. uh, on the continent uh, in terms of pension growth and growth. There is a decent amount for all of these. And within that, I, I include not only the traditional ones, but others too. And I think that's because they've seen their work in other markets. Um, I think the challenge, though, and this does differ from sort of country to country, uh, is to take a place like Nigeria. Where discretion cannot invest a lot, but pension savings pool there cannot invest a lot in equities themselves. Right? So, to my mind, actually, equities are a form of alternative material. They need to get to a point where they are comfortable with investing a lot of money there. Uh, you take a market like Kenya, where regulation does allow them to invest a lot of money in equities, but the funds actually choose not to. Like they choose to have about 30% of their money um, in equities. That's what they've done over the um, so, if that's the posture, whether it's regulatory or whether it's the demand side of things, it's just not much going to be even more traditional risk assets. Uh, it becomes hard to get widespread adoption at all things like that. Um, which are certainly you know, not the best that we've seen in that. I mean, uh, in terms of actual relations we've had about clients and some of the contracts, I mean, we're not more dangerous, right? But I'm certainly seeing that demand for them. So it just depends. Um, but it's a mix of reasons why I take up more of the truth. 
two people on their, on their house, and Mr. Lopo alludes to the fact that uh, in Kenya there is not necessarily the demand for all of the vanilla, the underlying agencies, and yet we recently launched the, the next derivatives exchange in Kenya, it's the only uh, second exchange in, in Africa to have a derivatives exchange. What drove that decision, and how has the take up been? And, and do you find that it's challenging having the derivatives exchange in the underlying markets? And, uh, Maybe it's because you'd like to share some of that experience with us, please. Well, maybe if I go there, I'd like to just say that um, the growth alternative is actually a response to how we make uh, capital markets uh, finance and relevant to economies. Um, for a very long time, uh, investors would basically just look at the capital markets for short term returns. Um, ways of investing your money uh, with, with a no, without really focusing on how does this start with her. But there's a new thinking happening in Africa, especially about uh, governments around how do they tap into the capital market finance to kind of support other projects, infrastructure, etc. So um, in Kenya, for instance, uh, we are totally matched to the vision uh, of the country and scaling that down to uh, for uh, what we call the big four agenda of the country, we focus on manufacturing, agriculture, uh, industrial healthcare, and um, uh, food, food security. Now, we have identified opportunities for us to actually make our markets relevant to that big four agenda. And so, um, looking at that, we then were able to map each product, for instance, it's going to be housing. Uh, we have the REITs market. And the government is actually looking at the REITs market to raise capital to do affordable housing. If you look at the uh, universal healthcare and the rubbish around green malls, and how can those be relevant? Food security, how do we make the markets more efficient uh, by moving from stock markets to uh, chain traded markets? And so that really forms a very good foundation how alternatives are then now becoming uh, a real um, relevant. The second aspect of that is then where does the institutional funding sit? It's patient capital, it's long term capital. Then how do you create that uh, intersection that uh, Murray is talking about? That, that then becomes the opportunity for the exchanges to actually provide that uh, platform for mediation for this uh, investors and issues to meet. And so that, that pretty much forms the framework of why we think uh, these markets. Uh, I want to be very relevant for the growth of the countries. Speaking about the this market, I think that was largely informed by one um, demand from uh, local investors to for tools to protect the downside of, of, of the markets. Uh, the need for us to um, build our market and put us aside to be uh, making an open land with national financial center. Uh, the big exploration of the fact that we are more like an international market today, so investors are looking for a wide scale opportunities. And again, with a limited growth from the traditional markets, we have to think quite quickly how do we respond to that challenge, and that's why we come. Uh, it hasn't been an easy journey. It took us almost five years to put it together. Uh, we really underestimated uh, the task ahead, but we've been very successful. We launched it in July, and we've created over 350 contracts, mainly retail. But I think the, the interest is our gain currency amount, uh, is huge for funds, etc. Uh, we believe that it's going to really uh, catalyze the stock markets. I think it's just a matter of time. Uh, the contracts that we have identified on um, the liquid counters, so again, that creates a very good arbitrage and also for really uh, providing growth. So um, we think that it's going to be, it's going to propose slow takeoff, but very popular. But we're going to see growth in that. So I think the market is great, it's happening well. And uh, yeah, we're just working towards uh, building and making it more and more successful. Now, so Judy speaks about um, one aspect of bringing alternatives more mainstream. What are some of the trends that you see in, in the developed markets in terms of how you can actually bring this more mainstream? And which of those do you think will be relevant to Africa? What should our, our African capital markets play as we focus on? Technology. Uh, just look at Goldman Sachs uh, saying that they want to become a tech firm because they're short term. Uh, he's not doing that well, but they are still investing. JP Morgan is investing heavily on technology, and there is a reason behind it. Uh, when I started in the derivatives industry, um, you wouldn't do a trade for less than $1 million. 
that means, and I shall tell this to uh, the free traffic later, that um, there, is a, there is an increase on the gap between the rock uh, investors and the institutional investors and the retail because retail don't have access to alternatives. And only way to achieve this is with technology. So we, we see every week a new platform coming in. Uh, you see that now you cannot get a job on banking if you don't know how to code, and probably will be a lot out of jobs in 10 years if you don't know how to code, just FYI. Um, and it's something that um, the Africa exchanges, you know, and I think you highlight the, the need of transparency and improving liquidity. It will be for technology to make these products cheaper and more available to retail investors. I think that needs to be the message. Right, right. I think in terms of the future of alternative assets in, in, in Africa, so incredibly important is that it is relevant to the local community. It's exactly what, what you think was specifically to earlier as well. So I can appreciate in the role things like infrastructure development or housing, some of these things that is a very clear linkage. But where else do you see the future for alternatives in Africa, specifically from the perspective of how do we make sure that this is relevant to the investors' needs in the continent? Uh, you'll find it in everything that we're servicing the communities. So basically, uh, if you're talking about agriculture, the products, and the servicing on agricultural aspects, you'll find alternatives coming in this area. These are servicing, again, in the area of real uh, estate. Uh, and how the community is being developed for, uh, for, for the other You'll find it as well in uh, uh, the derivatives components with, given its high volatility and potential higher returns and risk mitigation that they can uh, work uh, in this area. Education should be one of the area of uh, alternative, uh, maybe not direct through education companies, but in the facilities themselves uh, that are going to be uh, uh, promising and flourishing, I would say, in the going uh, period. But it's not about the sector, because at the end, the market dynamics will decide on which sectors that are going to be flourishing, given what who will be certain. It is about creating a conducive environment to enable, I would say, either operators like exchanges, either uh, entrepreneurs to come and develop, I would say, the services that they want, the markets that they want, and the assets to combine with these, uh, with these areas rather than trying to pinpoint on a particular, I would say, uh, sector in, in, uh, that, that would have some alternatives uh, being there in this area. Maybe what we miss in talking about would be the passive, uh, passive approach of investment through the ETFs, uh, if, if this is even considered as, as, uh, as an alternative. Uh, because ultimately the two biggest challenges for any investor would be the timing and the choice. By having ETFs on the indices or otherwise with different types of products, you're doing the diversification aspect that has been mentioned automatically, and as well the focusing on these ETFs by doing it for an incremental saving approach. This should be the direction, I would say, uh, and hope for the entire company, honestly speaking, not for only uh, one single uh, country of the capital market, but for the entire company. Having saving levels increasing to the level uh, through uh, an incremental approach, this is what would, would ensure that in 20 years' time, we would have a very different middle income class compared to what we're seeing nowadays in Africa, given that they're saving in a well diversified vehicle like ETFs and the likes uh, uh, for a long period of time. And hence, this, uh, this is what we should be seeing and uh, hopefully growing. You know what, if I, if I could summarize that, I think for any whether it's a product provider or whether it is a platform or an exchange, I think if your focus at the outset is not looking at what what's in it for me, how can I make money out of it, but rather what bring the need, am I serving the community, the society, what addressing, what problems that I'm addressing, you're guaranteed to have success. And I think that, that is our approach to why we implement alternative assets or ways in which we access it. I think that will be sure for our success for African capital markets. One thing uh, in China. <laughs> well, um, basically, in China, HSBC created a technology that a retail investor could create their own bonds for the minimum size of five hundred dollars. So I think that explains how technology can help get these products to retail.
Excellent. And how this can even be broken down by having structured funds that take this and even break it down for investors who say, uh, I would say, uh, unawarely, they are unaware of the saving of their saving through technological advances that Jeff mentioned, maybe in banking systems. Banking systems need now to be integrated with the saving and the investment community and uh, capital markets if we want to change the reality that we're facing nowadays. Absolutely. Thank you.